He's a professor in Oxford. He's a bestseller author. And, um, well, um, his talk is about everything you wanted to know about big data but never dared to ask. Please give him a warm welcome, Victor Meyer-Schönberger. Yep. Ja, danke, liebe Freunde. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Do I feel better than you? Yes, I do. I only got up at five o'clock this morning to fly and come into Berlin. Uh, that was when right about you went to bed, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is, uh, th that's what we call um, night shift, um, passing the baton on from one shift to the other. Uh, I have the morning shift. Um, it is also called the third day conference morning shift. Do you know what the nickname of that is? It's called the graveyard shift. <laughs> so thanks very much, Olivier, for giving me the graveyard shift, graveyard shift slot. Uh, it's, it's awful because half of the group is asleep and the other half has a hangover and thinks it's me that makes them headaches. So, I can only lose, but fortunately I already collected the red little papers. So you still have a choice to put the green or the green paper in the uh, champagne uh, thing. Okay. Now that I have explained democracy, I can now go on and explain big data. <laughs> I'll start with a story. The story is relatively straightforward and uh, it hopefully helps you wake up. The story has to do with the flu. Every year, tens of thousands of people around the world die because of the flu. But in 2009, a new flu virus was discovered called the H1N1 virus. And at that time, uh, Nobody had a vaccine for this new virus, and health authorities around the world feared that this particular virus might kill millions of people around the world. But because they had no vaccine, the best thing that they could do was try to, to limit the spread of the virus, much what you're trying to do with Ebola today. But in order to be able to limit the spread of the virus, they also needed to know where the virus actually was. And for that, in the U.S. context, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta mandate that all the doctors, the general practitioners out there, have to report each and every H1N1 case to them. And so then they get the data and they tabulate it up and they do the analysis and then the Centers for Disease Control are able to tell you where, with a high degree of likelihood, the flu was 10 to 14 days ago. Which, if you have a deadly pandemic on your hands, is about useless. Right about the same time, 2009, engineers at a little startup company in Silicon Valley, in Mountain View to be exact, had a little idea. And the idea was to be able to predict the spread of the flu just through internet search requests. That little startup company was called Google, and the idea was to use Google searches that are being sent to Google by customers. What did they do? Google receives about 5 billion search requests every single day. Google has saved every single one of those search requests over the last 15 years, including every single item that you ever clicked on. Also, they added um, information about where this particular request came from. So what they did was to take the last couple of years of search requests, where and when they came from, and the last couple of years of official flu data and try to find correlations. Um, they tested 50 million different search terms, 450 million different mathematical models, and then they had a model that really worked well. And I'm now showing you the official CDC flu data and the Google prediction. Quite good. So, 
Google was able, just by using the internet searches, to predict the spread of the flu. But were the Centers for Disease Control were always about 10 to 14 days behind, Google can do it almost in real time. It's called Google Flu Trends, and it is the inkling, the beginning of what we call big data. Now, big data, when you hear about it, you think about billions of data points, and there is some truth to it. It's a good starting point. It's not an ending point. It started perhaps 15, 20 years ago in the natural sciences. Take astronomy. In 2000, in the year 2000, the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that's a telescope, went online. And in the first couple of weeks of its operations, it collected more astronomy data than in the entire history of astronomy. Over the last 15 years, it has generated about 210 terabytes of astronomy data. And a follow-up telescope, here is your rendering, that goes online in the year 2016, will generate that amount of astronomy data every five days. Or take biology. Every one of us has a unique DNA, three billion base pairs that define who we are, at least to an extent. In 2003, uh, April of 2003, the world celebrated the first complete sequencing of a human genome. It took 10 years to take one person's human genome, 3 billion base pairs, and sequence it completely. It costed $1 billion to do that. If I go today to a lab to have my entire DNA sequenced, three billion base pairs, it takes about two to three days and costs less than $1,000. And then I have three billion data points. But as natural sciences are not the only area, internet companies too are drowning in data. There are 500, 500 million tweets a day. Uh, 800 million YouTube users upload an hour of video every single second, so you can't even watch all of the video, even if you watch continuously, that are uploaded. And 10 million photos are uploaded on Facebook every single hour. Of course, when you look at it, a lot of data is being processed, and Google processes dozens of petabytes of data a single day. Petabytes? More petabytes. Petabytes. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, I had a couple of petabytes. <laughs> How much is a freaking petabyte? Well, one way of looking at it is to think about a book and how much data a book has, and a journal, and a newspaper. And then add that up, and add up all of the data in all of the books in the largest library of the world, the Library of Congress. And then multiply that by 100, and then you have about a petabyte. If we look at the total amount of data in the world, the best guesstimates that we have is that from 1987 to the year 2007, the total amount of data increased 100 times. Oops. If you go back in human history when the last time, when, when was the last time the data increased as much? Elizabeth Eisenstein maintains that that was 1450 to 1503. In this 50 years back then, the total amount of data in the world doubled, 2x. Here we have 100x in 20 years. Remember what the Gutenberg Revolution, 1450 to 1500, did for the world? 30-year war, anybody? Re Reformation, all that. Now think about what a 100x increase could potentially do. But that is only half the story. The other half of the story is really denoted by the different colors that you see here. The light pink color is analog, the dark purple is digital. And if you look at the year 2000, that's that vertical white line here. I still remember the year 2000, Olivier does too. You don't, that's okay, I am old. But 
in the year 2000, three quarters of the data in the world was still analog. Today, it is less than 1%. Less than 1%. So within 15 years, we have moved from a analog to a digital world. Now, I was told that this is the 10th anniversary of the Typo 3 conference. So therefore, I have to offer, I was told, 10 insights into the world. Here is the first. We have more data than ever before. I need to work myself up. But what does it mean to have more data than in any time in the world? What, why should we care? You know, we have more pollution than in any time in the world before. Why is it significant? Well, think about, think about this. Take the analogy of photography. If I take a photo of a rider on a horse, then I have a photo of a rider on a horse. If I take a photo every second of a rider on a horse, I have a lot of photos of a rider on a horse. But what if I increase that even more, and if I take 16 photos of a rider on a horse per second, and I show them in huge succession, then the additional quantity translates into a new quality. And it's exactly that way in big data as well. Quantity, the increase in quantity, translates into a new quality. What is this quality all about? More messy and correlations summarize what it does. So first, more. More means that we have more data, not in absolute terms, but relative to the question we want to answer today, available than ever before. In the past, we needed small samples and small surveys and so forth in order to answer a question that we had. In the big data age, we will be able to almost comprehensively capture the data in, with more and more phenomenon uh, and answer the questions that we have. And thereby zoom in and out of details and let the data speak. Now, how does that play out? What does that mean? Well, let me use photography again. And this is the point where I take my camera out, my phone actually, and I take a picture of you. Ah, smile, please. As I am taking a picture, I have to make a choice. The choice is who do I put in focus? If I put the wonderful lady in the first row in focus, I am very sorry you back there with your great orange shirt are going to be blurry. I have to make a decision at the moment of collecting the data what's important to me and what isn't. And I can't go back and change it. I can't go back afterwards and say, you know, I look at the photograph and the lady is really nice, but I really want to have a focus on this nice gentleman back there. I can't do that. The data isn't there. The data isn't in the photograph anymore. So I need to know at the time of taking the photograph what I care about. And I can't go back. Same with data. I, when I collect the data, need to know all the questions that I want to ask the data for if I'm thinking in the small data age. That all changes as we are approaching the big data age. Take this photograph. That's a photograph of a toothbrush in the front. In the back, you see out of focus my four-year-old son. Now, I can't put him back into focus, can I? Well. Yes, I can. Because that actually is not an ordinary photograph. That is a photograph that was taken with a big data camera, also called a light field camera, or Lytra, that captures all focal panes and all light rays. And therefore, because this is a gigantonormous file, I can click on my son, and he comes into focus. Or I can click on the toothbrush, and it gets into focus. Because all the details are there, all the data is there. So if I have a new question to ask as I look at the photograph, that is, as I look at the data, I can answer it. In fact, I can use the data to tell me what kind of questions are really interesting. That's more. Messy means that in the big data age, I will look not just at one um, carefully curated data set, but I will combine data sets from various provenances with varying quality. 
And that means it's going to be messy. It's going to be of varying quality. But that messiness was a problem when we had small data. You know, when I only have 10 data points, seven of them are bad, then it's gigo, garbage in, garbage out. But if you have 10 million data points and 100 or 1,000 of them are wrong, that's less of a problem. It's not that we give up on exactitude altogether. It means that we do not focus on exactitude as our own sole mission anymore. What we lose in accuracy at the micro level, we gain in insight at the macro level. Combine more and messy, and then we make sense through analysis, looking for patterns in the data, looking for seeming connections in the data. Statisticians call that correlations. You are aware of that. Correlations do not, that's what you're being told in the first class of any statistics course, correlations do not tell you why. They don't give you causes. They only tell you what is going on. Now, in the case of Walmart, a little supermarket chain in the United States and elsewhere, it played out like this. Walmart has a lot of transaction data from all of its customers. So they did a big data analysis in order to find out what sells and when. And they discovered that when a hurricane hits a particular Walmart, or just before that, people go to the Walmart and they buy batteries, flashlights. Dude, I could have expected that, right? Nothing new there. And then they discovered the people also buy Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts? Pop-Tarts are a sugary American snack. Please note that I do not call it food. <laughs> Pop-Tarts. So when they did this number crunching, the people at Walmart said, why, 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 why are they buying Pop-Tarts? And which flavor, by the way, strawberry? Why are they buying Pop-Tarts? You know, does the hurricane go away if you eat the Pop-Tart? No. So, you know, they were thinking about all these causes until one of them said, time out, guys. The data doesn't tell us, and we don't need to know. Because all that we need to know is that the people buy Pop-Tarts. And so, when there is a hurricane approaching, the people in the Walmart should take the Pop-Tarts from the back to the front. That's what they do, and the revenues go up. Sometimes knowing what is good enough. Of course, for us human beings, that's incredibly hard and difficult. Why? Because we see the world as a sequence of causes and effects all the time. Right? If I come to Berlin and have dinner here yesterday night, I didn't, and I have an upset stomach this morning, I, my brain would immediately say it must have been what I ate last night, even though, statistically speaking, it's far more likely that I got a stomach bug by shaking hands with some of you. My brain tries to explain the world to me by creating causes and effects, even though they don't exist comforts me, gives me a sense of understanding. And oftentimes, as Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman said, it's just plain wrong. So rather than coming up with causalities that are really hard to prove, maybe we should learn to walk before we learn to run. That is, maybe we should look at correlations first. Now, Let's look at a way to do that. Um, you have heard of this company. And when in the 1990s they started to experiment with recommendation systems, what they did was to have a small data approach. That is, they had their marketing people in the room and they said, how are we going to do this? And the marketing people said, oh, we know exactly how to do this. We have here a couple of dozen categories predefined categories of shoppers. The single uh, male car lover, the young family, the hobby cook, and so forth. And all that we need to do is, based on the transactions of the people, we slot our customers into any of these predefined categories. 
And then we slot the books that we have into these categories. And boom, we have a match and we can recommend something. That was called recommendations based on predefined categories. And that was actually used by Amazon. And the result was to quote an Amazon employee involved in this, like going shopping with the village idiot. <laughs> and so Jeff Bezos scraped the entire project and said, we need to do better. And the better approach was a big data approach. What did they say? They said, we don't know what categories apply. Everybody may be a category on him or herself. So let's throw out the predefined categories, the predefined customer segmentation. Let us look at the data, which categories, which linkages, which preference complementarities evolve. The result was a system called item by item recommendation that Amazon patented, but more importantly, it is so freaking good that Amazon derives a third of its revenue from it. That is what big data can do with it. Now, why is this so important? Because we need to understand that we as human beings oftentimes understand less of the world than we think when we have predefined categories about markets and so forth, these might actually be things where we fool ourselves. They might be wrong. And so we need to be humble and to understand our own limitations and look at the data rather than look at our beliefs and intuitions and stereotypes. We need to let the data speak. Take away number three. Now, if you think that this is all confined to marketing, targeted advertising, and so forth, like Walmart and Amazon. Think again. It's going to affect every single part of our lives. Take one that is far removed from marketing and sales. Medicine. It's a group of people, very, very young people, that are particularly vulnerable. Vulnerable to infections. Premature babies. Like this one. And when they get an infection, oftentimes it's too late to give them the medication and they die. So Dr. Carol McGregor at the University Hospital in Toronto had a big data idea to help these. She gave them digital sensors that would measure the vital signs of these babies to the tune of 1,200 data points a second. Collect them and collect them over hours and days and weeks and dozens and dozens of babies and then do a big data analysis to define and find out the pattern of these vital signs like heart rate and, and, and blood pressure and so forth that with a high degree of likelihood would predict the future onset of an infection. And she found that. They can now predict the onset, the likely onset of an infection 24 hours before the first symptoms manifest themselves. And that saves babies. Two kickers here. First, the pattern that predicts with a high degree of likelihood the onset of an infection is not that the vital signs go crazy. The pattern is that the vital signs suddenly are enormously stable. What kind of a pediatrician, what kind of a doctor would have thought about that, right? Because when the vital signs stabilized, everybody would have gone home and said, baby's doing well. It's exactly the other way around with premature babies. Big data showed that. And by the way, Dr. Carolyn McGregor is not a medical doctor, she's a computer scientist. That's big data. More data points, messy sometimes of varying quality, and correlational. She doesn't know why. She only knows what. But in this case, too, that's good enough. That, of course, depends on our ability to render every more aspect of our lives into data form, called datafication. And we already know that we are rendering more and more stuff in data form. Location now is in data form. I still remember, oh my god, another age kind of joke. I still remember driving with a map. None of my students does that anymore, except if they want to do sort of a historical road trip. <laughs> <laughs> so
So location has been datafied. But it goes on and on and on. Many more aspects. Researchers in Tokyo have datafied our behinds. They have measured people's behinds through 30, 30 sensors and datafied them. Turns out that every one of our behinds is different, much like a fingerprint. Why would you measure that? <laughs> Don't ever ask researchers that question. But it turns out they actually have an application, and that is an anti-theft device for cars. You get into your car, your car measures your behind, you are recognized, you can drive off. <laughs> Wait. Thief gets into the car, behind is recognized, too big, car does not drive off. That's the beauty of datafication. Now, you already have seen this, these are Google Glasses, and the first version of Google Glasses don't do what I think Google Glasses actually should do based on what Google wants them to do. And that is to datafy the human gaze, to datafy what human beings are looking at. Can you imagine how valuable that would be to know which street sign which advertisement we are actually looking at, what we are looking at when we are looking at a shopping window, what men look at when they walk down the street. <laughs> Skip the last one, we already know that. <clears throat> so that is datafication, that is rendering ever more aspects of our lives into data form, and that is a prerequisite to then extract value, economic value as well. And if there is anything that you take away, apart from the jokes, from this morning lecture, it is that in the past, in the small data age, because collecting and analyzing data was so expensive, we collected as little as possible, then used it, then threw it away. In the big data age, we are collecting data, using it, reusing it, reusing it again for very different purposes over and over again and each time we do that we extract more value. It's like an iceberg where we have currently only extracted the part that is above the surface but where there's a huge piece of value underneath. I'll give you an example of a startup company out of MIT called Price Stats. What does Price Stats do? Price Stats goes on the, out on the internet and records down price points of consumer goods at Amazon and eBay and all of the other e-commerce companies to the tune of collecting billions of price points every single day. What do they do with it? They use it for real-time predictions of inflation rates. And so good are their predictions that uh, magazines like The Economist are using their predictions rather than um, the official numbers uh, in cases of Argentina and other countries because they are more trustworthy. Or take another startup company called Inrix out of Seattle. What Inrix does, uh, and quite remarkably so, is to help you drive to work and back relatively swiftly by knowing where there is heavy traffic. And they give you heat maps like this. Now, you look at me and say, give me a break, I already have that on my sat nav. No, you don't, if you have the same stupid sat-nav that I have in my car that only tells me when I'm in a traffic jam when I'm actually in a traffic jam. <laughs> Inrix has a different approach. Inrix tells you when a traffic jam is being building up slowly because it already knows. But how do they do this? How do they get the data? It turns out that they have 100 million users every working day. 100 million users. And every single one of them is a sensor. Because as you use the app, the app sends back to Inrix where you are, how fast you are going, etc. And so they have billions of data points every single day that they can then use. Now, interestingly enough, Inrix offers this as a free service, but guess what? They discovered that they can reuse the data. And so they have now teamed up with a hedge fund an investment company, because they found out that data on weekend traffic, of weekend traffic around shopping malls, correlates with revenues of the shops in the shopping mall. 
And so they now play the stock market. The value lies in the reuse of data. This leads to companies changing their entire business model. Think of Rolls Royce, not the luxury car maker, but the jet engine producer, the second largest in the world. When they produced the jet engine for the Airbus 380, they needed to build a lot of sensors in there that measures temperature and, and um, uh, vibration and uh, pre uh, pressure and so forth. And that is being sent to the computer in the jet engine to manage the jet engine in flight. Then it's thrown away. With the Airbus 380 and onwards, Rolls Royce changed the system and collects the data. Once the airplane lands, the data is being sent back to Rolls Royce. What do they do with the data of hundreds and hundreds of jet engines? They do big data analysis and they can now predict when a part in the jet engine breaks before it actually breaks. And do something that is called predictive maintenance. And offer a repair and maintenance contracts to airlines at a fixed price. That meant that they are now moving from producing and selling jet engines to selling a service. And Within a couple of years, they moved to a company that for 50 to 70 percent of the revenues are derived from services rather than from production. Or think about this, um, a cell phone station, um, a cell tower. What is a cell tower? Oh, a cell tower is part of a mobile phone network. No, a cell tower, a mobile phone operator in the Netherlands discovered is actually a big data generation platform. It turns out that the signal strength of a signal of a cell tower changes depending on the local weather around the cell tower. And so the signal strength change can then be used to derive temperature and humidity and so forth around the cell tower. So this mobile phone company discovered that it has about 10,000 real-time weather stations ingesting lots and lots of data, and they have a weather forecasting data collection platform. Ah, remember this? This is a Nest, a thermostat. A thermostat. Google paid a couple of billion dollars earlier this year for a thermostat company. Are they freaking crazy? They didn't buy the thermostat company. They bought a data collection platform for the home. It's all about this. It's all about the fact that business model change and new opportunities arise and also new competitors. In the past, it was that you knew your competitor. You don't anymore. You know who the biggest new competitor is to Daimler-Benz and BMW? Google. Because they had the tenacity and the risk-taking attitude to really think hard about a self-driving car. What are the consequences for organizations? Well, here is an interesting element. In organizations, in lots of organizations, including in yours, Many, many people have to make decisions every single day. And some of these decisions are made by so-called self-styled experts. In particular, they are, I hope you let me indulge in this, middle-aged men, a little heavier set, they sit there and we say with a very <clears throat> deep voice, I know the answer. My experience tells me. Their experience doesn't tell them any shit. Their experience tells them that they should come up with an answer and be very confident about it. That's how decision making is done in most organizations these days, at least those that I am part of. That is changing. Uh, at Google, they had a particular issue a couple of years ago. They needed to define a border two pixel wide and find the right color for it. So their chief designer picked a particular blue. The boss of the chief designer, Marissa Meyer, now CEO at Yahoo, said, why did you pick that blue? And he said, trust me, I'm the chief designer. And she said, no. 
I want you to test it. I want you to have data to show it. And he said, that's ridiculous. I'm a designer. I know this. If you want me to do this, I will resign. And Marissa Meyer said, resignation accepted. Then they tested 41 different shades of blue and discovered that a slightly different hue of blue, almost invisibly different from the one that the designer picked, would increase ad revenue clicks by $12 million a year. So Marissa Meyer to this day says the best thing that she ever did at Google was to fire that chief designer. But it means that the subject matter expert will be less and less important if he or she cannot back up his suggestions or her suggestions with good data based on good analysis. Now, how far can we take this? There's a discount, um, uh, discount market called Target in the United States. And Target got into headlines because they can, through big data analysis, predict that a woman, a female customer, is pregnant based on the shopping transactions before a lot of times the woman knows herself. Whoa. <laughs> Takeaway number seven, not every use is ethical. And when we think about that, a lot of people are getting the creeps. A lot of people are losing the trust in the system, in big data, in the internet, in the entire ecosystem of the data age because they think we are continuously surveyed. You're capturing all the information about it. George Orwell was just kidding compared to what we're doing today. Uh, I was at a, uh, at a conference yesterday and a guy said, wow, you know, these, all these Stasi officers, they must kind of be completely suicidal now because they had all the data but didn't have the tools available to do all these great analysis. They were just 20 years too early. So there is really this surveillance component with big data that's very, very prevalent. And, and we have nothing, nothing against that, it seems. We have no mechanism to secure that. Now, some people say, ah, it doesn't matter because I have nothing to hide. I, why should we forget something about me? Why should I forget something about me? Everything is important about me. I want to self-preserve. I want to take everything with me all the time. Even the stupid blog entry that I wrote some 20 odd years ago. It turns out that that's just a perception, a subjective perception, because we know from studies of human beings like this one who have biological difficulties forgetting. This is AJ, she can't forget. If you ask her for any particular day, the last 30 years, she will tell you when she woke up, what was on television, who called, and how the weather was. Ooh, freaky. So when we talk to her and do an analysis, a research analysis and, uh, about her situation, she has great troubles with this permanency of memory. Because whenever she has to make a decision in the present, she's reminded of all her failed decisions of the past. And so that inhibits her ability to act and live in time. So in that sense, it's important also in this big data age where we derive so much value to it to understand that just because how we function, some data ought to be forgotten. It's not that we want to forget because we want to hide something. It is because it sometimes is irrelevant to who we are or what we have to decide in the present, but it comes into uh, the, the, the process and inhibits it. So some data ought to be forgotten, but of course, which? Right. Now, with individuals, we pretty much know how to forget, right? We, we forget most of the stuff that we see every day. And the moment our brain thinks something is irrelevant, I forget it, where I placed my keys, for example, or so forth. Um, but most of the stuff that our brain thinks is relevant, we don't forget. First name of our partner, these kind of things. That is different if you 
look at organizational remembering and forgetting. Because with organizations, we don't know what the organization should remember and what they should forget. If you help a particular customer go out there and try to help them what to preserve, what to remember, what do you model against? The ideal organization? Does the ideal organization remember everything or nothing or whatever? You know, there are startups in the, um, the Silicon Valley that have prohibited now the use of email because it creates preservation and memory that they think doesn't let the people focus on the present. That's how far you can go. So every organization has maybe a different sweet spot of how much they want to remember and forget. Remembering and forgetting for organizations is different from individual remembering and forgetting and there's no easy answer. That's why a number of you, sir, and back there, and Olivier in the front, and myself included, are involved in a research project at the European Union level uh, called Forget It that tries to build mechanisms of managed remembering and forgetting and also build it into Typo 3. But what are we going to do about the dark sides beyond surveillance? Because surveillance is only one of the dark sides. There's another dark side. The dark side that with big data we might predict human behavior in the future. What people are going to do rather than what they have done. And hold them responsible, punish them perhaps for something that they are only predicted to do. If you now think of Minority Report, the Hollywood movie, that's precisely what I'm aiming at. Now, you think that's crazy, right? It's not. In 30 American states, the question of whether somebody gets free on parole after serving in prison is made by a big data analysis that predicts whether or not he or she is going to be involved in another crime in the next 12 months. That is Minority Report. Minority Report works with tax authorities in Italy. Tax authorities use a huge big data engine in order to find out who shall be subjected to an audit. A Steuerprüfung. Ah. If we continue to do that, we will end up in a world there is no free will anymore. Because if you are going to be punished for something that you have not yet done, and you are being imprisoned for it, how can you prove that you wouldn't have done it? You can't. You're guilty. Now, of course, if you're already guilty, you also, and if you can't choose about the future, you also have no responsibility anymore. It's a crazy world. However, it's not the world that is caused by big data itself. It's caused by how we use and employ big data. I told you that correlations are no causality, that knowing what doesn't tell us why. But the problem is that we human beings always misuse, abuse data analysis and trying to say this is why things are the way they are. So big data analysis is always under the, cur under the threat of being abused for causal purposes, for assigning punishment. And when you think about this, this goes far beyond the government. You know, if we could do a prediction about whether somebody's going to be a good driver or a bad driver before he takes the driver's license test, shall we then give him the driver's license? What if we do, but what if the insurance companies do the same thing? Would they then give him an insurance policy? Would he perhaps have to pay double for the same insurance policy? Not because he has ever had an accident, but because the prediction says he's more likely that he will. What we need to do is to beware of the dictatorship of data. That is of imbuing the data with more meaning than it actually has. There's a big data analysis that tells us that the cars in the United States that have the least repairs are cars of a color orange. <laughs> Half of you are already beginning to think why. <laughs> oh, it's 
more visible at bad light. Oh, it's a special car, specially produced, so it has fewer faults. Oh, the owner really likes the car, paid extra for it, perhaps, and therefore is more careful driving it. Oh, you're all so wrong because the data don't tell you. It's correlations, guys. It's not causality. But what you're doing is so natural and so human. We always think we see more causes and effects in numbers and data than there is out there. And that is what we have to be aware of. So here I come to the end. Big data is going to help us understand the world better. It will improve how we make decisions in our world, from what medical treatments work to how better our kids and we can learn to how cars can drive themselves. But it also brings enormous new dark sides and new challenges. So what is essential is that we harness this technology knowing and understanding we must remain in control. And that just as there is a vital need to learn from the data and to do the big data analysis, we also need to carve out a space for not doing it. For being original, creative, irrational. For sometimes just acting in defiance of what the data says. In my case, that's eating steak. <clears throat> because the data is always just the shadow of reality, and therefore always imperfect and always incomplete. So as we walk into this very exciting big data age, we also need to do so with a lot of humility and a lot of humanity. Thanks very much.